plus 15 degrees one day, minus 10 the next. After many parts of Ontario just experienced the warmest February on record, weird weather is more than a passing concern for those planning to put crops in the ground next month. Elizabeth Lee is a professor in the Plant Agriculture Department at the University of Guelph, and she joins us now to explain how farmers are adapting to such topsy-turvy growing seasons. Nice to have you here. Thanks for the invite. I'm going to read something just to get us started here. This is from science journalist Patch and Bars, who wrote, Many climate models suggest Ontario farmers might actually benefit from climate change in the form of warmer temperatures, a longer growing season, and a northern expansion of the province's farmable region. But it's not that simple. So let's get into this. And let's start with the last thing. Why is it not that simple? Well, um, for starters, uh, with the change in climate, we're going to see a change in things like diseases. We're going to have more diseases to cope with. We're probably going to see some different uh, insect pests than we've had to cope with before. Um, those are the two probably of the big things. Um, some of the land that's uh, north of here um, that uh, might be more, well, the climate, climate change is not going to necessarily open up that land for farming. Uh, the soil type is not necessarily as, as uh, suited for farming as what we find in southern or southwestern Ontario. So before we get too excited about mm -hmm. all of these new growing seasons and we're going to grow fruit and timmons yeah, in the middle yeah. of February, <laughs> hold the fort. Hold the fort, yes. Okay. We're going to put a couple of maps up here, and I'd like you to okay. uh, take us through these if you would. Sure. Okay. There's our province of Ontario. Mm. Growing degree days in the province. And we see lots of different colors there. So yep. help us understand what we're seeing here. Okay, so this is a map that uh, runs from about 1971 to 2000. The darker, the warmer the colors, the more heat that's actually being accumulated uh, during the growing season. So plants need heat, and, and the more heat that's accumulated, generally the longer the growing season is for these plants. Uh, so you can see that the darkest or the warmest colors are southwestern Ontario and kind of along the lakes. And then as you move, start to move kind of north, Things get cooler and cooler. Less and less. So. Less and less. Okay. Can we flip over to the next one? So this is uh, what they're projecting uh, based on some modeling work that uh, I believe Ag Canada has done. Uh, what it's probably going to look like out around 2030 in terms of, of uh, growing degree days. And so you can you, More orange. More you orange. You can good. see. Well, that's definitely more, war more warmth for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Longer growing seasons. And generally, longer growing seasons mean more grain yield. Um, so, so all things are, are good in that respect. And so, a growing degree day just means the length of the season? Uh, a growing grow? degree day is a way of kind of uh, accumulating, counting the amount of heat that you get um, in any given day over the course of a season. Is this to suggest that we will have longer growing seasons and can grow more things further away from the border? I think we can grow probably more things further away from the border. We're definitely starting to see farmers plant, for example, soybeans far earlier than they've ever planted soybeans before. Um, but in terms of climate change, I think the real benefits will be observed in the prairie provinces more so than, than in Ontario. Let's take a look again. Can we bring this next picture up? What do we got going here? Yeah, so this is a photo of a soybean crop, and it is one of the top two crops, I would say, growing in Ontario. It's the probably being... the other being corn. Mm -hmm. Um, there's probably right now more soybean acreage than, than corn acreage, and that has to do more with the cost or the, the price that you can sell soybeans for. You get a better price for soybeans? Uh, right now, I believe the, the market price for soybeans is better than corn. What does it do to your efforts to both plant, grow, and get yield when it's minus 15 one day and plus 10 the next? <laughs> um, you know, when it's happening in March, it's probably not as bad as when it's, um, you're having those, those dramatic temperature swings in late April or, or early May when you really want to be out there planting. Uh, farmers aren't any different than some of your passionate garter, gardeners that get itchy to get their fingers dirty, and right about now they're probably starting to go nuts, right? Uh, farmers are just like that. Hmm. Okay, I'm not a gardener, as I'm about to That's okay. clearly <laughs> demonstrate to you right now. Uh, so you'll, you're going to fix my my wrong phrase here, but I've heard things like, my perennials don't know that they're not supposed to be coming up yet. Yeah, so, so crops like corn and soy are what we call annual crops. And, and so we plant them in the spring, harvest them in the fall, and, and they don't overwinter. A perennial, on the other hand, will come out of what we call dormancy. 
and, and so certainly things like fruit trees are really susceptible to these swings in, in temperature. A few years ago, I, I, we had really warm uh, temperatures and it brought a lot of the fruit trees out of, out of hibernation or, or uh, well, yeah, hibernation basically. Yeah, like when it's and, 50, and, plus 15 in yeah, February, yeah, and, fruit tree thinks, okay, showtime. Yeah, and then frost showed up and right. killed a lot of those buds. And so we had a, that, that is a real huge problem on, on our perennials. So when do farmers feel they can be frost-free nowadays? Um, well, it's pretty hard to stop a farmer from planting corn the last week of April uh, around Guelph. So we're still a ways away from that. So yet, we're though. still a ways away from that. Um, and, and when you move further south from, from Guelph, down around uh, Harrow, for example, uh, they're probably in the field planting mid-April, uh, as soon as they can get in, basically. What happens if you guess wrong about when you can plant? Well, you can pay a penalty. So if you guess wrong and you plant and your crop comes up, um, you may end up getting a, a killing frost that does a lot of damage uh, to that crop. There's a certain period of time where that crop is somewhat protected uh, from the frost, but, but uh, once it gets large enough, it's, uh, it could be quite susceptible to frost damage. If our farmers are facing more variability in mm -hmm. the weather, is there anything that they can do to mitigate their risks? I think the big thing is uh, soil health that we're really focusing on right now. What does that mean? Um, it means a lot of things. So it means that you want good organic matter content in your soils. It means that you want to prevent erosion of, of your soils due to uh, water, due to wind, things like that. Um, it means that you probably want to increase the biodiversity uh, that you're pl uh, on your farm. So that increases the biodiversity of, of the soil's microbiome. So we talk about the human gut microbiome, mm -hmm. while the soil has its own microbiome as well. Okay, Sheldon, let's do number eight here, okay? We got uh, some pictures coming up about what farmers can do to the soil to protect their crops. Uh, Liz, what are we looking at here? Yeah, so one of the uh, good strategies is trying to keep your soil covered uh, through late fall, through the winter, and into the spring. And, and this is an example of a cover crop. It's uh, called ryegrass. It's planted into uh, corn stubble. It was actually probably planted before the corn was harvested. This corn was taken for, for silage, and, and so when the corn's gone, uh, the perennial ryegrass or ryegrass just greens up and covers the soil, captures nutrients uh, instead of nutrients leaching out of the soil. Um, it's a source of good organic matter when it's plowed in in the spring, um, and it's protecting the soil from both wind and, and water erosion. Okay, so that was my next question. How, how soil erosion happens in the first place? Mm -hmm. Wind taking the topsoil away? Yeah, yeah. You, you, we saw a lot of that this summer, or this winter when you're driving around on... Uh, this is an example of water erosion, pretty serious water erosion, and we've seen some of that this spring with the heavy rains that we've had. So the water came in there and just took that whole... Yeah, but just... Um, top layer of topsoil out. Yeah, yeah, and, and... And that doesn't come back? No, topsoil is a non-renewable resource. Hmm. Uh, it takes about 500 years to replace an inch of topsoil. So once it's gone, what so do you once do? It's, once it's gone, it's essentially gone. And um, what do you do then? You, uh, you cope with the consequences. How does climate change, in your view, figure into the loss of seed diversity? Certainly as plant breeders, um, which is what my training is, is um, we need diversity. We need a lot of genetic diversity because we're trying to develop crops that are more resilient to, to the environment. That could be being able to cope with uh, water stress better. It could be uh, having to cope with temperature uh, swings in, in a more efficient manner or with, with less loss of, of yield, for example. So genetic diversity is, is uh, very important to everyone. Um, going back to those, those gene pools for uh, resistance to new diseases, uh, resistance or tolerances to new insects um, are, are, is also very important. Is there much research underway right now to figure out how to get farmers to better adapt to this? Well, the seed companies are certainly spending a tremendous amount of, of resources on, on trying to develop more resilient uh, uh, sources of hybrids and, and varieties. They've got very specialized uh, research facilities in, in areas that are very prone to drought and they can just uh, apply uh, controlled amounts of water and, and basically select and develop the best varieties under, under those conditions. Let me read you this excerpt from Fortune magazine, mm -hmm. which goes like this. Picture a farmer harvesting a crop in a sunny Iowa field. The word data probably isn't one of the things that come to mind, but against the backdrop of that bucolic imagery, the modern agriculture industry is as wired up as any other. 
Thanks in large part to a concept known as precision agriculture, fields are now mapped with GPS coordinates. Okay, help us get our heads around this. <laughs> Data, farmer's fields? Yeah, yeah, so farming meets IBM meets Google is one way to think about it. It's kind of the next Silicon Valley as a colleague of mine refers to it. Um, big data is very important. Uh, we have the abilities to, to collect a tremendous amount of data on how those plants are growing, tremendous amount of data on the uh, characteristics of the field, uh, integrate that with weather, uh, come up with prescriptions for these are better hybrids to plant or better varieties to plant in certain parts of the field, um, more of a prescribed fertilizer regime. Uh, these are your highest yielding parts of the field. It could be saying, well, it doesn't really make sense to farm this chunk of land because it's not very productive, and we've got the data to, to, to prove hmm. that. So, Do you think farmers are disheartened at how things are changing under their feet as they try to adjust to what climate change is doing? Well, in terms of the big data uh, piece, I think uh, there's a lot of farmers that are very intrigued by it. I think that they're taking it up quite rapidly, although they are concerned about who actually owns their, their data. They don't want to give up uh, their data to somebody else. Basically. Everything is proprietary. Everything right? is proprietary. Yeah. Just finally, mm -hmm. this spring, farmers, yep. what are they expecting? More of the same, <laughs> <laughs> which is there is no normal when it comes to Ontario climate uh, right now. I've lived here for almost 19 years, and no two summer, springs and summers have been the same. Kind of hard to plan your life when that happens. Pretty much. You just kind of have to roll with the punches. That's part of the job description that's, of being a farmer, isn't exactly, it? Exactly. Right exactly. That's Elizabeth Lee from the University of Guelph. Thanks, Liz, for coming uh, all the way down the 401 <laughs> to be with us here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you for the invite. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.